Wisconsin Dells. Uh, my wife, Abby, and I came out from Illinois a couple days ago where we've been staying and uh, checked back in with our home church in Oshkosh, made sure it was still there, and uh, did some flying and tried to keep current. I'm not able to fly as much in the States as I am in Cameroon, so I try to do my best to stay uh, up to date and current with everything. We have one new airplane that is waiting to go to Cameroon. It's in Oshkosh right now, so I flew that yesterday just to try to keep myself um, kind of the top of my game, if you will. This new airplane has a lot of computers. And uh, what else? Uh, it's just a very, very capable airplane. A little bit bigger and stronger. It's not a Boeing. It's not a 737. It's not quite right? that big, but uh, <laughs> you know, for for what we do, it's uh, perfect. Let's put it that way. Exactly. Um, so these airplanes are made or fabricated in Washington State, and uh, you can buy the kit and build them yourself. So we have three of them that are like that, and uh, they're very tough and rugged over for the kind of flying that we do in Africa. So we're thankful for the Lord's provision. For getting those airplanes, uh, providing that, that need for the people over there and for our ministry, and look forward to getting back there in God's time. There's uh, quite a conflict raging in Cameroon right now, on the English side especially, and a year ago, our co-worker, Brother Charles Wesco, um, was a new missionary in Cameroon with his family, his wife, and eight children, and two weeks into his missionary service, he was shot and killed, really as a direct, really as a ball, as a response, as a as a result of the rebels and the government. Um, who knows how it happened? Um, who knows exactly? Not blaming anybody, but it was just a result of the conflict that's going on over there. It's right in the middle of it, and so that has changed um, our ministry drastically, if we could put it that way. And we are right now in the stages of planning to learn French. We're already working on it so that we can reach more Cameroonians. Cameroonians speak English, they speak French, and I guess if you knew Fofolde faster, you could reach just about every Cameroonian with those three languages. And uh, we predominantly ministered, I would say, in Pidgin, um, maybe 75% Pidgin English, 25% English, and uh, we didn't know French, so we didn't use that. We didn't know Fofolde, so we didn't use that, but where we were, uh, Pidgin and English is what everybody spoke, and so we um, enjoyed getting to, to know that language and, and use it, and now we're looking forward to learning French, Lord willing, in Quebec City, starting in December. And then once we're um, well on the way of learning French, we trust to get back to Cameroon and help our co-workers who are um, over there. Some of our co-workers are learning French in Canada with us. Some are going back to Cameroon to try to learn it there. Others are trying to learn it elsewhere. So there's been a shake-up and a moving of our ministry over there. We'll pray for all of us as we try to learn French so we can reach the other part of Cameroon, which is also in great need of the gospel as well. Um, we were on the English side for seven years in a planted Believers Baptist Church, and I wanted to show you a couple of pictures um, kind of showing the progression of that ministry. But I wanted to challenge you as well at the same time in John chapter 4. If you're turning your Bibles with me there this morning, John chapter 4. <clears throat> Sorry, John chapter 9. John chapter 9. As you're turning there, I know we didn't, we don't have a lot of time this, today to talk a whole lot about details of ministry in Cameroon, but did you have a question that maybe from what you've heard about Cameroon or what you saw in our video, do you have a quick question or two? Some are still turning there. Just a brief question. Anybody's just burning with something they want to ask. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, so you left the church with the Bible in your hand. Yep, I will show you. That part is going to come. Um, so if I don't get to it, make sure I answer that question at the end. But I want to show you how we left the church with Pastor Presentus. So, yes, ma'am. I'm just curious about the difference between the Muslims that are going around killing people and the Muslims that you meet that you're trying to spread the gospel. Right, right. Where we were, um, the Muslims there are what we would call the cowboys of the country. They raise the beef, they raise the cattle. Um, some of them are fairly wealthy. Um, but to be honest with you, the Muslims in our area, uh, we rub shoulders with them every day. Um, you can sit down and talk the gospel with them. They're not going to hurt you. In fact, it's more of a lively debate that might, you might spur on, and uh, it's a friendly. I think, Pastor, you would agree that you had a lot of friends who are Muslims, and uh, good friends, people that you could trust your life to. Um, that's how they are in our particular area. In fact, when we keep our airplanes, they 
they help to make sure that nobody does anything to our airplanes. Um, this is their country, it's their territory. They're happy for us to live there. Now, when someone trusts Christ as their savior, things can get a little more interesting, but they're not going around doing what you hear on the news in the Middle East to people either. Except in the far north of Cameroon right now, different brand of Islam has come in from Nigeria and they are trying to stir up these other Muslims and others. And they are really tearing apart northern Cameroon right now. And it's been going on for, what, five years, six years, something like that. So there is a wide variety of, of Muslims in Cameroon. But where we were specifically, um, they're just, uh, I would say, nominal Muslims. And some of them are pretty serious, but none of them were like what you hear in the news, except this brand that's coming from Nigeria. And the government is trying to put a stop to it. It's a war. It's a full-fledged war um, up there. And soldiers are being trained to stop it, and uh, battles are being fought daily. So that's a, that's a full-fledged war that's being run in northern Cameroon. But in the general part of Cameroon, Muslims and Christians, for the most part, they get along. Every now and then there's an issue that comes up because of cattle grazing, and that's less religious and more land rights that they, that they fight over. So, you know, but living with Muslims over there has been so far a very normal experience or very peaceful. So, but pray for those who do trust Christ because they go through the fires of persecution. So, good. Anything else? John chapter 9, read a few verses, and uh, I really wanted to show you some pictures kind of based on some thoughts here. Um, I wish we could go through this entire chapter. I'd encourage you to read it today, maybe tonight. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. I love it when you see in the Bible how Jesus sees a person. Because when he sees somebody, something usually happens. He meets a need. He sees them for a reason. And uh, just encourage you this morning, Jesus sees you. He knows your needs. He knows why you came to church today. He knows why. He knows what can keep you from church. And to be honest with you, when things keep you from church, it's probably when you need it the most. And church isn't the answer. I hope you know that. It's what you hear here. It's Jesus himself. He's the reason we come to church. In John chapter 9, we see Jesus in action, um, his heart, his ministry, and the key word coming up here, his works. But Jesus sees this man, but the disciples also see him. And they have an interesting question. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man, the blind man, or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, how could he have sinned and caused his blindness if he was born that way? <laughs> um, I do not sit in judgment of the disciples anymore. I used to. I, I have done things that people probably wondered what in the world did he just I've raised kids, I've heard their questions. Um, I've probably asked some interesting questions. You've probably asked some questions that somebody looked at and they're like, did you not understand the full situation here? Think about what you just said. I try to tell that to my kids. Think about what you just asked me for a minute. <laughs> but you know, Jesus didn't really put them down, but he uses it. Tremendous chapter is now launched off of this question. And I think, to be honest with you, verse 1, Jesus was going to do something anyway, but he uses their question to really teach some things here as well. But he answers them, and he says, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. It's not his fault, it's not their fault, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, I'll just flat out tell you right now, I don't understand everything about this or any other bad thing that happens. Um, our missionary friend in Cameroon, the question, why was he shot and killed two weeks into the country? What about his wife? What about his kids? Who sinned? Him, his family, country, this person, that person? Whose fault was it? I don't know. And I don't necessarily think it's anybody's fault. This goes, this problem goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Um, this problem goes all the way back to um, the battle of good versus evil. We still suffer the consequences of Adam and sin today. And it's a brutal reminder when a loved one dies. That's not, it's not God's desire. It's not his plan. But God loves the death of his saints at the same time because now they're with him. When a saved person dies, well, they're with God right away. Charles Wesco would not want to return. But he would certainly 
trusted his family to God that God's going to take care of his family. He didn't go there with the intent of being killed. But if you read everything he preached and said up to that point, he was absolutely ready and willing. I don't think he knew that that would happen, but he said so many things that he was absolutely spiritually ready to be done. And he was doing the work that he believed with all his heart God called him to do. And I've told people before, I think I mentioned last night, the pastor or to Brother um, Hanson, you know, if I die in Africa flying an airplane, don't feel sorry for me. That's what I wanted to be doing. I'd rather die serving God and doing what I want to do than, you know, die in some way that everybody would say, what was he doing there? Or, you know, this problem or that problem. And we can't necessarily choose the way we die. We can't choose if we are blind or deaf or have another issue in our life that we struggle with. And we all have problems in our life that we just maybe don't have an answer for. But wow, God is trying to teach us something here that there may be an issue in your life that God wants to work through in a wonderful way that will bring so many people to him. Amen. Are you willing to be that channel? Even right now, if you stand here this morning and you're perfectly healthy, every, all your finances are in order, your life is going great, are you still willing to be a channel that a difficulty would bring people to Christ? That's what happened to Charles Westbrook. All his ducks were in row. He was healthy. Financially, he was fit. <laughs> he, I mean, that man was amazing in so many ways. So you have this perfect specimen, this perfect missionary, lays down his life in two weeks. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to let the problem you've had for years be used by God to bring him glory? I mean, God just, Jesus simply says that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Are you willing to let God use you? This blind man didn't have any idea what was coming. I think he had surrendered to his blindness. He was making do. Um, you see his attitude throughout this story. He just seems to be a man that was was excited to be used by God and, and to discover God, to be honest with you. Um, what an amazing story. You kind of have to read the whole chapter to, to build up to the climax, but we're not going to have time to do that. I do want to get to the climax here in a second. But first of all, verse number four. It's the key verse for this morning. I must work the works of him that sent me. This is Jesus talking about God the Father sending him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now, we live in the United States of America, 2019. Does night stop us from working anymore? 24-7, this world is hung and buzzing with activity, is it not? Put yourself, uh, your pastor's lived in this place, I've lived in Cameroon. Cameroon and, and biblical culture is similar in many ways. How many of you have ever traveled outside the United States? Let's see your hands. Okay. How many of you have been to a third world country? Kind of along the equator-ish route, right? Okay. So how many days, or how many hours are in our day, working day? How many, how many hours of light? Well, depends on summer, winter, right? Well, on the equator, it doesn't change. Cameroon, it only varies by about half an hour or so throughout the year. Um, where Jesus is, how many hours of light does he say there are? Where, did we get to that part yet? Um, I forget where it is here. Somewhere in the story, it's 12 hours of day he talks about. And that means 12 hours of night. So it's pretty evenly matched there. You have 12 hours of daylight to do your work. And then 12 hours to recover, rest, sleep, fellowship, eat, uh, so many things that go on during that time. But sun up, everyone's already busy. And wow, in Cameroon, the sun comes up, people are moving. Sun goes down, people start slowing down. Yes, sir. Well, I just let you know, it's uh, John 11, 9. Is, are there not 12 hours in the day? So right, right across the page. Thank you. I read that this morning. I had no idea where it was. <laughs> um, 12 hours in the day, where they are. You know, but let's let's get to the spiritual application, but also think about it today. What in Jesus' time, as well as today, what are the you know in Jesus' day there were some occupations that did have to work at night? There were still some. He wasn't saying that you can't work at night. He was just saying the night comes and that's pretty much activity stops and you know the work is done and you, you do other things. But even in his day and in our day, who are the people that still have to work at night? Doctors, so medical, who else? Same as in Jesus' day. So when you before you answer, think about is that would that have been the same with him? 
Police. Police. So security, uh, medical. I don't give you one more. <laughs> that have to work. What about, okay. what about pastors? We're gonna put military with security, all right? Okay. We'll pull a bunch of them in there. Pastors. pastors. Yeah. You know that there's a story in John chapter three. Jesus was a sort of pastor, right? He's a shepherd of people. Nicodemus, when did he come to him? In the middle of the night. How many of you have called your pastor after hours? <laughs> you know, they're available because I don't think Americans realize it, but one of the reasons why Americans are struggling with so many issues in life is because they don't even realize they have a spiritual side of them. Amen. Spiritual side of you is just as important as your finances, as your body. And if people don't take care of their spiritual life, they struggle with their whole life. Their finances, their body, everything about them is more difficult because either one, they don't believe in God, or two, they don't take it seriously. Pastors are important. They're just as important as your medical and as your security. They're here to guide you into the Word of God and Try they, their heart is burning to bring you closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nicodemus came in the middle of the night, and Jesus met him and led him, led him to himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was to Nicodemus, doctor of the Jewish law, had a basic need in his heart of salvation. Jesus said, For lack of better words, it's me. <laughs> God's only begotten son. You have to believe in him. I'm so glad my dad shared that verse with me when I was a boy. My dad was in the army. He's a captain. He drove tanks. He trained people how to drive tanks. He trained people how to shoot and make war. He wrote books on it. Even preparing for Desert Storm, he was involved in the training and writing the manuals. Of what to do in the desert. Desert warfare. You know, there's a lot of training that happened right before it happened. But my dad loved his son enough to tell me about God's only begotten son. And I trusted Christ as my Savior as a boy of six years old. My dad was my spiritual father in many ways. We have a spiritual need, and it's Jesus Christ who came to bring us salvation. And Jesus came to meet the physical need of this man. Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. You know, today... Today you have something to do before the end of the day that God wants you to do. Do you wake up every day and think like that? I have something today that God wants me to do. If you're a Christian, God has a work for you to do today, this very day, before the sun goes down. Let's let's extend the hours a little bit before you go to bed. We'll just say that. <laughs> right? Before let's let's extend the hours even more before you die. God also has something for you to do. Your time's not done on this earth until God's done with you. You have a work to do. You know, we have a, a, a broad work. You know, I, I would consider my work as missions. That's a very broad work. But today, I have something to do as well. Something that matters, something that God wants me to do, something important. I, I trust and pray that you can, before God, you know what your work is today. And if you never thought like that, just sit down and think about it. Lord, what do you want me to do today? It could be one thing. It could be many things. It could be part of a bigger plan. It could be something unexpected. Wow, are you flexible? Willing to say, well, I was planning to do this, but I think God wants me to do this. Well, Jesus lived his life like that. The night is coming when no man can work. And, you know, I think of the opportunities. There are, there are some opportunities where the door is open temporarily. And we have to take advantage of it. Let me tell you a quick story. There's an opportunity to witness to soldiers in Cameroon that we had recently. Well, while I was over there, uh, I met the, the man in charge. And actually, I sent him a letter because I didn't know who to talk to. I went to the base and uh, wanted to, you know, I grew up on military bases. I'm comfortable there. I enjoy it. And so I wanted to, to meet the soldiers that I saw. And, and God gave us an open door. The major, it turns out, was a believer. When he got my letter, he was surprised. He called me up and said, absolutely, come on in. We got to preach to 800 soldiers two different times. These soldiers were being trained to go up north to fight against local power. Some of them died. 
but they're all carrying with them French and English, depending on their language, John and Romans. Amen. That door was only open for a short time. We tried to continue to do so. We lost track of the major. Who knows where he was transferred mm -hmm. to? We never had the same opportunity as we did for those couple of times. The night's coming when no man can work. You know, spiritually, God has a work for you to do right now, today, tomorrow, for the rest of your life, whatever, however you want to look at it. But there's coming a time when the door will be closed, whether for your life or whether for this day. Once today's done, so is today's work. We need to be, be, be ready to do what God wants us to do. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Aren't you glad that our work has to do with Jesus Christ? Showing people that he is the light, that he is the way. He is our salvation. You go through this whole story, and immediately as Jesus is done preaching to his disciples, he spits on the ground, makes clay, anoints the eyes of this man, heals him, makes him blind, says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. He does it. He is seeing this man is healed. God is glorified. Now the rest of this chapter is debate and discussion and persecution. The religious leaders don't like what happened. They don't like that Jesus is getting credit and glory for this great miracle, and this man ends up getting kicked out of the synagogue. This man who was healed of his blindness is now an ex, an outcast. Can you imagine being born blind your whole, and, and not being able to see your whole life and getting healed and then immediately you're unacceptable to the religious elites because you're giving glory to God through Jesus Christ? I think of you know many people who are outcasts of society and then they trust Christ, and now they're even more an outcast. Wow. <laughs> what a surprise. But look at this man's attitude. Jesus comes to him after he's kicked out of the synagogue in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. I love that. I love Jesus' introduction of himself here to this man. It doesn't come right out and say it, but it's so obvious. And this man accepts it on the spot. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. That's what it's all about. And that's the whole point of this story. You know, this man was healed physically. But this man gained spiritual sight as well. He was blind spiritually, blind physically his whole life, and in one day now he can see physically and he can see spiritually. What a change this man experienced. His life was turned around drastically. Have you accepted Christ this morning? Is he your Savior? Is he the one that you worship? Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. You know, we, we can worship Christ today. You may have accepted him. You may have believed on him many years ago, but how's your heart to worship this morning? You lost sight of him? Have you, is your sight kind of going down, dimming back to blindness? I hope not. Or can you still see Jesus with excitement and worship and passion? I want to show you a few pictures this morning as we wrap it up. we just got a couple minutes. Some of the people that have trusted Christ in Cameroon. Not going to go into all of these details that I normally do. Um, this is our original church building. You saw some of these pictures already. Um, our church was closed down for a period of uh, six weeks by the government. Um, won't go into that story right now, but um, pray for this, this man, um, Brother Noah. He trusted in Christ. He was a student looking for answers. Not in school. He wasn't finding them. He, he, he was kind of pacing up and down on the street outside of our church one Wednesday night and finally got the courage to come in. And he met Christ that night. And today he's a refugee on the French side because of all the struggle on the English side. And he's still preparing for ministry. I was able to train him a little bit while I was there. He did a lot of correspondence through me. And now he's with another missionary family. And just trust that God will give him the ministry that God has for him. He's called to preach. And he wants to serve God. Pray for Brother Noah. Well, this was, our, this was a baptism during a time when our church was shut down. So we kind of went to the next village to do this. And, uh, you know, a church is not a church just because of the building where they meet. And that was a wonderful time in persecution to teach people what the church is. And, uh, wow, we, we praise the Lord for the fruit that we saw even during that time. And ordination, three of our best men right here on the front row. 
Um, the red shirt, Pastor Chrysanthus, he's the one that's taken the church that we started. He worked with me for seven years. And my coworker, Brother Tom, uh, Brother Ben over there, Pastor Julius, Pastor Eugene, and then these three in the front. A piece of land that God gave us, a miracle. Really, honestly, a miracle of God's provision. Um, this is a landlocked town. Not able to find land very easily. Twenty-five thousand. All the all the land that's available is towards the back in the fields where the cornfields are. God gave us a piece right off the main road, hundred meters off the road, so it's quiet, but within walking distance of the main highway. And uh, just has been a perfect piece of property for the church as they as we went forward. And it looks like I'm out of time. Let's see where we go. Um, Brother Joshua, he's uh, one of our deacons now. And he was a Presbyterian, trusting in his good works, trusting in his baptism. And he was pretty mad at me when he came and uh, was hearing the gospel for the first time and hearing some... I was just preaching the Bible. I had no idea his background. I don't preach against Presbyterians. <laughs> I don't preach against Catholics. Um, we just preach the Word of God. And if it contradicts what you've always known or heard, you got a decision to make, right? Um, maybe it will entail a little bit more study just to be sure you need to satisfy yourself. But if the Spirit of God's tugging at you... Well, he was under conviction for a while, and finally, Pastor Chrysanthus led him to Christ, and he's just become a right-hand man in the church, and has just steadily grown. You know, once you see and you get excited about the actual words of God, not tradition, not what you've always heard, but you get in and you see the Bible for yourself, I tell you, you can grow by leaps and bounds in a short time. Amen. And what a blessing it is to have seen that happen with Joshua. Um, my, my neighbor, Brother Elvis, trusted the Lord in our, our church. Wow, so many, uh, this is our first uh, service in the new property, sorry. Maybe we can change our batteries. I think we're about out of time anyway, right, Pastor? Let me show you uh, Chrysanthus if I can. Show you. Uh, well, I've Christian. never gone over time, so. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, good group of guys here, Joshua, Franklin, um, Brother Constantine, Brother David, um, Louis, and Fidelis. Brother Fidelis, anyone know what that name means, Fidelis? Let me tell you about him. I'll tell you what his name means. Right now, because of the conflict, the young men are not able to travel as freely because they're targets by both sides. Uh, if you're on a motorcycle today, that is just such a common way of life in Canada. Everyone has motorcycles, but now if you have one, you're an immediate target because this, the government associates that with the rebels. So you can be dispatched like that. And so they, they can't travel as freely. They have to be far more careful. So Brother Fidelis is in the 70s. He says, well, I'll go. Young man can't go over to check on the church in the next village. I'll go. I'm not a target. So he gets on the bike or the taxi and heads on over there, encourages the believers helps them in their evangelism, comes back. His name means faithful. And what, what, what a blessing he was to me over the years. And, and uh, wow, just uh, pray for these brethren over there. Um, show you one more picture here. It's our building project. So we were able to expand the old building into a new, bigger one. <clears throat> just uh, praise the Lord for that. This is all happening right before we left. Um, that's the new building there. We took, we left the old building there and just expanded on and doubled it in size, really, under the new roof. This is the old Sunday school building. The pastor and his family have moved there for security and safety reasons, and they want to expand this one and replace the roof as well. They're trying to work on that right now. Um, but just pray for uh, Chris Angus. Let me show you this picture right here. So this is our two deacons, David and Joshua. The church uh, voted them as, as deacons, and they accepted, they called uh, Pastor Chrysanthus to be their pastor. So he was planning on maybe moving on and planting a church somewhere else. But he realized that you can be planting churches in other villages, because that's what we were doing, and also be the pastor of this church. And So he, they said, why not him? Why can't he be our pastor? I said, well, go ask him. <laughs> and he accepted the call to pastor Believers Baptist Church. And uh, so glad that he's there. 
um, is a very mature Christian and uh, trusts the Lord with everything. And uh, pray for him, pray for his family, and uh, as they carry on. So, David getting married right before we left. This is my first full wedding that I did. I did some other interesting ones, but this one was the first full from our church, I guess I could say. And uh, I'm just really happy about it. just trying to teach on marriage, and it so contradicts their culture. And uh, just what a blessing to see people follow God. Very happy picture right there. Weddings always make people happy, but that was a very special wedding. And there's a picture I want to show you, pastor, the new pastor at work and the old pastor sitting down. And uh, just pray for the brethren as they continue on. And here he is in his office with the deacons and other three men who promised to support the pastor and the ministry. And while they're going through hard times right now because of the war, pray for them. Pray for their safety. Every day there's gunshots in their town. And uh, every day they just don't know what life is going to bring. But they are doing God's work. From morning to night, they are looking to do something for God. And they're staying faithful, staying put, right through this conflict. It's been years, three years now. And these, some of these, I don't think any of these people have left. And I uh, pray for them, that uh, God will continue to use them, protect them, and just for his glory, that his work will be done. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your time this morning. I'll show you a few more pictures than uh, you got in the video. But uh, just remember that chapter in John chapter 9, verse number 4, and uh, find out what God wants you to do. Thank you, Pastor.